The Bob Murphy Show, episode 118. There's a tidal wave coming. What you gonna do? Get ready for another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. The podcast promoting free markets, free minds, and grateful souls. It's your source for commentary and interviews, conducted by a Christian and economist. Now here's your host, Bob Murphy. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Bob Murphy Show. My guest today is economist David R. Henderson. Now you may remember we had a great conversation way back on episode 8. So you go to bobmurphyshow.com slash eight to go see that one where we went through David's personal odyssey and becoming an economist and some fun stories, including uh, when he went toe-to-toe with Paul Krugman for the Council of Economic Advisors. But today what David's going to be talking about is he recently had an article for the Hoover Institution on the so-called stimulus bill, and David's going to walk through some of the key points he made in that article showing why, in fact, This is an anti-stimulus bill and what he considered to be uh, crude industrial policy. And another big thing we cover is the unemployment insurance augmentation from the federal level and why that's just going to be a disaster in terms of giving people an incentive not to return uh, to work. Uh, And then the other thing we talk about near the end of the interview is David personally helped organize a protest out in California wanting to end the lockdown like having people go back to work or at least be, being given the option to do so. And so that's a fun little conversation we had. So as far as his uh, formal bio here, David R. Henderson is a research fellow with Stanford University's Hoover Institution and an emeritus professor of economics at the Graduate School of Business and Public Policy at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. He also blogs at EconLog. And in the past, he's written a lot for antiwar.com. Some of you might know him from that uh, outlet. So without further ado, here is my conversation with economist David R. Henderson. Well, David, welcome back to The Bob Murphy Show. Thanks, Bob. So uh, I think probably the, the first thing I want to do is, is just have you walk through some of the main points. Your, your Hoover Institution article on the so-called stimulus bill was the single best piece I saw of it. And so Thank just you. for the benefit of our listeners, uh, maybe I'll just prod your memory and just you know point out some of the things. Yes. You know what? I do have to move my cat. He keeps okay, moving that, that's his fine. computer and it's making it. I'm going to hold off a minute and move okay. him. Okay. <laughs> he keeps moving the computer so it's three weeks. Yeah. 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 It's the only way, otherwise. <laughs> okay, we're good. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll just restart that sentence. Sure. Okay. So, David, I think uh, your your Hoover Institution piece on the so-called stimulus bill was the single best analysis I've seen, you know, from an economics perspective, just laying out the perverse incentives and some of the crazy stuff in there. So I think I'll just uh, prod your memory by just mentioning a few things and just have you riff on it. That's OK. So right. you start out and you have this sort of provocative claim. You're saying this isn't even a stimulus bill. It's industrial policy. So what, what did you mean by that? that the federal government, both through fiscal policy, which is the part of it I know best, well, I'll, I'll stick with fiscal policy for a minute. The federal government is having the, is picking winners and losers. And typically, and, and what I mean by that is they're lending lots of money. It was supposed to be to small business and doesn't mean it should have been to small business, but it was supposed to be. And a lot of it is not. It seems to be given to or lent to companies that were most set up with their banks to get it. So it was a kind of first come, first serve. And large companies tend to have an advantage in that. So that's a kind of a a silly industrial policy, not that there's a good one, but I mean, it's a random industrial policy. Maybe that's the term I should have used. And and the other thing is, it's not even typically going to be a loan. If it's a 1% loan, 1% interest rate, and if you qual- if you do certain things, spend a certain percent on rent, utilities, and wages, you don't have to pay it back. And so again, that will favor certain kinds of industries that have certain kinds of firms that have big wage rent utility bills and not others. 
And so again, it's a it's a it's a, it's an industrial policy without a thought behind it. Okay. Now it, that particular measure you just talked about is that what the so-called PPP is, or is that something else? That's the uh, pr- paycheck protection, protection provision. I don't know what the last P stands yeah, for. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Pay, paycheck protection is what I call it. Yes. Okay. So. That's that. And so just again, for the, let me just rephrase that or paraphrase it. So you're, what they're saying is, hey, we're giving loans out to businesses because we know these are tough times and the liquidity has dried up. And so we, the federal governors are going to be standing behind you and hey, these are affordable loans. They're only 1%, but then it turns into just a flat handout of money in the sense that as long as they use, was it 75% of the lent amount for, and it was what? rent and utilities and wages and wages. I think that's it. Yeah. yeah. Then it's, it's forgive it's forgiven, which, which means right. the money is just given to you. And so your it's, it's interesting. Your point. I didn't even think about that is that certain businesses that's not like wages and those things. They're not that big of a component. So like, there's no way right. they could. And in fact, I didn't think about it till this minute. It's oh. not in my article. <laughs> so for example, right. the thing that just literally occurred to me, Let's say you're a business that relies heavily on contractors. Those are not legally wages. Mm-hmm. So you pro- and, and let's say you're a, a virtual business running out of a home or running out of a small office. You're not paying much rent. You're not paying much in utilities. You're not going to you're going to have to pay it back. I think this was designed to penalize the Bob Murphy show. That's what it sounds like <laughs> to me. So, or, or like more real, like, you know, oil drilling, like when we do the critique, you know, Bombaver's critique of Marx, I don't know if you know this with David, but like, that was the famous flaw in Marxian economics is that his explanation for profit, it, it, like there are certain industries like oil rigging, you know, oil rigs that are very capital intensive, whereas like hairdressing, there's much more labor. And, and I didn't even realize that until you just point, brought that point up that, yeah, it's this, this yeah. by de- almost by construction, certain ones couldn't get it. So, I mean, yeah. of course, just so the listener's not lost. The thought behind that was, oh, we don't want to hand out money to businesses unless they help their workers with it. That's the whole point. So we don't right. want them laying people off. And right. So that's, and a better way to mm-hmm. avoid laying people off was to avoid one of the other bad parts of the bill. Which yeah. So why don't you go into that? Yeah. Unemployment insurance. Okay. So I'm sure people heard about that. And, and at first, let me just mention, I was skeptical. I thought, because people were saying, oh, people are getting paid more than they made. And I thought, oh, come on, they're not doing that. And apparently they are. So why don't you explain that? Tens of millions of people. So uh, the federal government back in March, and I blogged about it at the time when they still had a chance to reverse this, but they didn't. They said, okay, that the Congress put in a $600 per week additional payment for unemployment insurance. And that means that you typically from a state government get half your previous wage, unless you're very high paid and then you get a lower percent. Mm -hmm. But a typical number is $350 a week. So you get 600 from the feds, that's 950. Maybe you were making 700 a week. So you're making more, and by the way, it's not subject to the payroll tax. Mm -hmm. You're making more by being unemployed than by being employed. Now, there are two groups to talk about. Those who are already unemployed under this, and they get it. And will they come back? Many of them won't until the 1st of August, because that's when this runs out. Then there are people, and I wrote about this in the article, uh, and the Wall Street Journal found actual examples where employers said, you know what? This isn't coming out of my pocket. It's coming out of the federal government. I might retain goodwill with my employees by firing them. Mm -hmm. And they come back, they got a nice three-month vacation or four-month vacation, and, and then they're back. And so it's kind of crazy. That's why I said it, the recovery will probably be slow, but it probably won't start till August. Mm-hmm. And, and this is also why lost. you were saying this is is not a stimulus bill, like even conceding yes. the point that the government could, quote, stimulate the economy. You're saying, if anything, this is an anti-stimulus. It's an anti-stimulus They're literally bill. paying people not to work. By the way, work. the author, or sorry, the editor, um, Tanku Veradarajan, actually used my title. And I, you know, you've written a lot of op-eds. Right. And you rarely get your own title being used. Right, so right. I was pleased by that. <laughs> um, okay, so so again, just to, to condense that and crystallize it, that typically the state governments are the ones that administer unemployment, so-called unemployment insurance. Right. Whether, whether insurance is the right term or not, but okay, fine. You know, benefits paid, you, people get laid up. And then typically that's some fun, some fraction of your what you were making when you were employed. Right, typically 50%. Okay, up to, you know, it gets capped at some... 
level. Yeah. And then, um, but the federal, it, it didn't augment it. It didn't say, Hey, let's, you know, augment it by 40 percentage points or something rather. Right, I, if you were going to do it, that's what I would have wanted. Make right. it 80, 85% retain some incentive to work, make them almost whole. Mm-hmm. And they didn't do that. Okay. Instead, they just gave a flat 600. Right. And right. okay. And, and as you say, that, that federal provision goes through the end of July, which is why you're saying, regardless of when the state governments, you know, do their phased, you know, return to work kind of stuff, you know, get rid of the lockdowns and whatever, you're thinking there can't really be a full recovery in the labor market until that goes away. Because literally we have situations where a lot of workers based on how much they made are getting paid more to not work at all. Well put. And I'm glad you used the word full recovery. The recovery, of course, will start the day Mm -hmm. the lockdowns end, but it'd be very slow Mm -hmm. until August 1st. Okay. Can I just ask, again, we can't get in people's heads, but with this kind of thing, I mean, it's like, do do, do they, I'm skeptical. I wonder, is this partly uh, like the Democrats knew this is the only way we can beat Trump is if the economy is terrible. And so we're going to, you know what I mean? Like this, that, that thing yeah. is such an obvious point, like to pay people more to not work. Like even Congress people should get that. Like they have economists on staff. How could they not know that? I'm, I'm hesitant to attribute motives since I don't know the players. Right. I can think of another one that I think is more plausible, but I, I okay, sure. don't mm-hmm. know. And that is when they were debating this, a huge percent, a disproportionate number of the governor's, a disproportionate percentage of the governors who were imposing lockdowns were Democratic governors mm-hmm. in Democratic states. And so they knew there'd be pushback. How do you make sure there's little pushback? Take most of the people who are unemployed or a large percent of the people who are unemployed and pay them more to be unemployed. And mm-hmm. by the way, charge it to all taxpayers, not just taxpayers in Democratic states. So mm-hmm. that's a kind of a plausible one. I'll also point out that I actually blogged about this on March 25th when there was time to reverse it. Mm -hmm. And someone on the on the comments said, well, maybe they intended this because they think people shouldn't go back to work till the end of July. And I said, wow, that's really Adam Smith's man of system. Like they know that the end of July is the right time. And they Mm -hmm. at the end of March. Really? Uh, So so who knows? Also, I just want to say Mm -hmm. I was on a discussion on this on Facebook with an economist who's kind of left of center, but he and I have been co-authors. And he said, well, it's only 600 a month. And I said, no, Bob, it's 600 a week. Right. And he's very quick then to rationalize, you know, <laughs> oh, well, that's all right too. So I don't know. It, it's, uh, it, it's, it's funny you bring that up, David, because when I first read your piece and saw that, you know, what, how it was, I thought, okay, maybe it's 600 a month. Cause that wouldn't be too crazy. And then I looked, I reread your thing and it was an oh, a week. And I was like, wow, yeah. that's, that's yeah. really amazing. So the equivalent would have been 150 a week. And you know, again, mm-hmm. that would have had hugely bad consequences. Okay. So I, I do, I do like the fairness that it, it is possible as that other person brought up you, that you said that in the comments that it's conceivable that if the people designing this were being advised and saying, you know, we don't want workers to be in a position of having to choose between money and their health and or yeah. you know, just spreading the disease if they're a low risk population, but we don't want them out there. Let's let's take the angst away. Let's take the anxiety away and just say, no, you're, you're getting paid more to stay home, which is what we want you to do for public health reasons. So I right. whether that's really what happened, I could see that, though. I'm sorry. Hmm? Even there, there would have been a better way to do it, OK, which is to have some marker. Like if the number of infections at this point is this much, it's gone down that much, the number of deaths mm-hmm. per week has gone, you know, it kicks off. Right. I mean, if you think about it, extended unemployment benefits, which the federal government started putting in under Nixon as an automatic thing in recessions, automatically, the, the federal government funds for an extra 13 weeks during recessions, those automatically kick off when what's called the insured unemployment rate hits 4%. In other words, the per- percent of people who are covered by unemployment insurance is under 4%. They kick off. And so you could have had that kind of kick off. But again, these people were giving away our money and our children's money and not caring very much and badly wanting a bill. I mean, there were no good actors in this other than one guy, clear cut, Thomas Massey from Kentucky. And I know what why you're saying that, but just for the listeners who don't know, why are you singling him out as the the one 
voice of well, nobility. And I should give credit to other people who voted against it because there were a few, but not many. But Thomas Massey was the guy who said, no, we aren't going to just say this goes through automatically. We've got to have a quorum. And so all these people complained about having to fly back to Washington, the poor dears. And then he didn't manage even to get a voice vote. So they were that cowardly that they wouldn't put their themselves on record. Let me make sure I understand this. So, and I, <laughs> um, this is where the interviewer should have been better prepared. My understanding. So they didn't fly back to do it. They did. They did fly back. He succeeded. Oh, he got them to do that. Okay. I will not, I will object. So they had to have 200 and, 70, something like that, people in Congress to vote on it. Okay. And, and it was an overwhelmingly vo- overwhelming voice vote, but okay. they, didn't have, I should, I should, they didn't have a recorded vote. That's the term I should have used. Okay. So, he, so clearly he, he, it yeah. passed because just by the eyes and the whole room's eye and, no, you know. Right, right. But, right. Techni- but so you're saying, strictly speaking, we don't know who voted for it and who didn't vote for it? R- right, right. <laughs> Beyond that. And I've heard this. I couldn't find it because because I got busy with other things. But I think you've talked about that left wing comedian Jimmy Dore. Yeah, yeah. I think you've talked about it. Yeah. So a friend of mine who listens to him every day, it, AOC was acting like she had voted against it. Uh-huh. And so what he did was he played the actual sound of the voice, and all you hear these men go no, <laughs> nay, and you don't hear one female voice. So it was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's interesting. Okay. So still going through your article here. Um, it, you mentioned another quirk of this thing is with the airlines yeah. and then how goofy this stuff is. Like, again, it, even conceding philosophically and the, the, the morality of what they were doing, just the design of this was so stupid. So can you talk about that? Right. Uh, two aspects. One is that, that they couldn't imagine an airline going bankrupt, which means they haven't paid any attention for the last 30 years. Because I would bet every single congressman and congresswoman has flown on a bankrupt airline. Airlines fly bankrupt a lot. I think Delta is the major one that's never gone bankrupt, but and Southwest, of course. But I think American United and and the other older airlines that all gone bankrupt. Can we, if you don't mind, Dave, can we just pause for a second on that one? Because that is something I know, like with car companies too. So I think the average person thinks if you go bankrupt. That means you, you you lost the game and your business gets broken up and and yet there's all these cases and the pressure like like rich like oh Trump's been bankrupt such and such times and da 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 yeah. and so do you just mind explaining that for the, the I don't listener mind who at all. always wonder I'll go back to, to the auto yeah. industry during the big financial crisis before but before I do two main kinds of bankruptcy Chapter Eleven and Chapter Seven Chapter Eleven you go bankrupt you make deals with creditors you keep operating. Chapter seven is actually a dissolution of the firm. Mm -hmm. And so back during, and so the airlines went bankrupt under chapter 11. Mm -hmm. The auto industry or GM was about to go bankrupt under chapter seven back in 2008, which meant there would not have been a GM. The assets would have literally been sold. And that's what people often picture when they talk about bankruptcy. And that's what made the Bush administration very skittish. I think they still should have let it go bankrupt. Mm-hmm. But anyway, that's why they uh, they pushed to to uh, to ignore Congress's intent and use some of the bailout funds to bail out GM. And that's why they were calling it government motors for a while. Yes, yeah. and then Obama continued it big time. Yeah. So that's correct. Yeah. Okay. So back to now the the point you were saying they were acting like a bankrupt airlines that's inconceivable, and yet no, that's that that happens all the time in the United States. Right. And then so what what did they do then? to prevent this inconceivable outcome. Well, then they subsidized them, but they had a provision in there. I guess they're worried about subsidizing them and have the airlines shut down. They said in order to get the subsidy, you have to fly some percent of the flights you were flying to various locations. So if you're a major airline flying between LA and Chicago, you can cut that percent and fly once a day, you know, whatever, and still, still get the subsidy. But what about if you're flying to a place where not many people want to fly even in a day? And so there are actual examples. I blogged about one yesterday where the, where the pilot greets the passenger, mm-hmm. the passenger on a major flight, on a major, large, big you know, plane that holds somewhere between 100 and 200 passengers. And I think I couldn't back this up, but I'd remembered reading it. He paid forty dollars. 
Wow. Uh-huh. And that might, I might be confusing two stories, but I know there was one where it was one passenger who paid $40 for his airfare and they flew mm-hmm. and they flew because, I mean, they could have in any kind of reasonable system, they could offer him three grand and he goes, you know what? I'm fine. Uh-huh. <laughs> or maybe five grand, you know, or maybe they offer him a private jet for 10 grand, but uh, cause he had a funeral to go to. But, um, this is crazy. This is crazy. And that's what they're doing. And so jet blue, and Spirit went to the Department of Transportation and said, look, can we cut these flights? Not many people fly on them, and they are covered by other airlines. So they kind of thought through it rationally. Mm. So people wouldn't be stranded. They could still go on some airline. And the DOT said, no, no, you've got to fly. Mm-hmm. So uh, just to to understand how this could have happened, because, again, the optics would have looked bad if, oh, you're giving all this money to the airlines while they're simultaneously cutting flights, you know, by 40 percent and leaving, you yeah. know, and then that means the fares are higher than they otherwise would be because of the cutbacks in supply. So th- right. to avoid that, they were saying, we're going to give you money to keep you afloat, but you right. can't cut service. Th- that right. that was the can't thinking. Cut curves, can't cut service below some percent. Right. OK. And, and yet the perversity uh, on the flip side of that, I don't know if this was on your radar, David, but I heard. So in New York City. In order to, um, they they thought, oh, the right thing to do with, you know, to, to slow the spread of this is to restrict subway service. Like, because yeah. we don't want so many people. But of course, that was the opposite. That concentrated the ridership. So they're rubbing elbows with each other. And the same yes. thing too, like I remember here, you know, I'm in Massachusetts. I remember as they were phasing this stuff in, like on St. Patrick's Day, they didn't shut the bars down on St. Patrick's Day, but they restricted the hours. It was like, they had to close at midnight or oh. something like that, which is the opposite of what, if you're going to have it open, don't restrict the hours. Cause then that makes yeah. you know people get concentrated. Yeah. And I remember when Jacksonville, Florida opened up on the beaches and they restricted to eight hours in the day. And this wasn't in the winter when maybe you've got eight hours of daylight. Mm. This was a week and a half ago when you have something like 13 hours of daylight and it's crazy. So you have probably 14 or 15 hours in which it's plausible to use that beach and they said, no, eight hours. It's a kind of a government mentality. I think I just think what's striking, and this goes beyond the stimulus bill, the anti-stimulus bill, but what's striking is how much government mentality has dominated, where people just think about rules. Mm-hmm. So you drive and watch a sunset and someone arrests you, you know, mm-hmm. for what? You're in your car alone watching a sunset, mm-hmm. you know, and people trying to be human, trying to do the things humans like doing, and government saying, no, nope, these are the rules. A good example of that, like in a different context, is um, with the so-called Green New Deal. That, yeah. Um, let me see if I can remember what it's, it was like. One of the provisions was was pushing for, you know, uh, all renewable sources of electricity by, you know, X, X year, or, you know, whatever it was. I don't remember right. the thing. And then another main thing was spending, you know, a trillion plus for all the commercial buildings to re- get retrofitted and have better insulation. And so I remember some economists, I forget who, what, which group it was, they pointed out like, well, wait a minute, if all those sources of electricity are renewable, we don't need to conserve power anymore. You know, we, we don't need to have a lower heating bill. Like, the, like it's, yeah, right. but they're so like, oh, we know to save the planet, you push for renewables and you push for better insulation, not realizing right, that, right. you know, so, so that's the kind of thing where it's, it's like, even on their own terms with this stuff, as you're pointing out, like a lot of it, or like you think New York city restricting the subway hours, like yeah. even on its own terms, that doesn't that does the opposite of what you're claiming the, the goal is here. Right. Which in that case right. was to you know stop this or slow the spread of the virus. Okay. Um, can we? Let me see. You you also mentioned that part. You know, typically when we think of a stimulus bill, the idea is to goose aggregate demand because oh, typically a recession is because there's a shortfall in consumer spending or you know business investment. And yet with this situation, even on standard Keynesian analysis, that, that's not, you don't need to goose aggregate demand here. So can you talk about that? Yeah, there's something in economics that I'm sure you're familiar with called real business cycle theory, where the business cycle arises from something on the supply side. This, I don't think, was anticipated right. by the real business cycle theorists that governments would purposely prevent production, <laughs> would purposefully slow down an economy. So this is clearly supply side by design, government by design, trying to reduce real GDP and succeeding. Mm -hmm. And so the clear cut solution, if that's what you're worried about, and I am, 
is to allow production, not to try to goose demand. And so, again, it just makes no sense. And I would have loved to have seen more Keynesians screaming about this. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, uh, and Greg Mankiw, I read his blog every day. He's a Keynesian I very, very much respect. And he's also somewhat of a friend. And I'm trying to think if he ever said this, and I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. In fairness, I, I, would, I will say Krugman acknowledged the point in the sense that he said, like, so he didn't like, spend paragraphs saying this isn't about boosting demand, but he yeah. was saying the point of these, of these payments is not, um, is not stimulus. He was saying it's just relief. So he yeah. was saying like, and he that, was saying the way to think about this, like if there's a natural disaster and you're just sending money so yeah. people don't starve, yeah. that's what this is. So he, he was well, kind of acknowledging you. that distinction. Yeah. 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 Um, one of those rare moments where we both say something nice about crew. <laughs> right. So, well, it's strange times, you know? Um, so you, you said something a minute ago that I would like to just elaborate upon here is that you're right. This, this is such a weird thing. Like you were saying that we, real business cycle people, they had an idea like, oh, there could be a crop failure or, you know, a technological right. blah, 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 or something and skills miss. But when they're thinking of a supply shock and like what could make GDP drop. And so, so like, this is an example um, like with George Selgin or Scott Sumner, like their framework where they would allow for price inflation to go up. You know, in other words, this, this is where, oh yeah, the reason, you know, there's a supply yeah. shock and whatever. And, and, and so if nominal GDP is growing at the same rate and real GDP drops, then, you know, prices rise and that's fine. But th like, this is just so like, I don't think anyone even dreamed up something like, well, yeah, well, what if, you know, you had a scenario where the government literally just prevented people from going to work. Right. Like this, right. Um, and so I, I guess, can you speak a bit, so let me just run this by you. I don't know if you saw my take on this, but depending on what estimate you look at, it's possible that right now the, un, the unemployment rate is something like 20%. Again, that might be a bit high, but it's, it's conceivable, which you know the U.S. hasn't seen since the 30s. And my point was, there's a sense in which this, is, yeah, that. this is worse because it's not like the most expendable 20%. Like this is some critical people that can't go to work. And so that's why there's a sense in which like the hit to GDP is probably going to be bigger than you would have thought just from the unemployment rate. So oh, that's a really good point. And can I elaborate on it? Because yeah. you made a good point, but I just want to say it in my words, that if you have a depression, the standard depression where there's a lack of demand, who's going to be laid off? The people whose productivity is lowest relative to the real wage. With this, who's going to be laid off? People whom the government has said are non-essential, and they've said it based on some very iffy criteria, like there are 16 industries they've laid out having to do with infrastructure, and if you're that, it's fine. And so, again, that's a government central planning way of thinking. What are the odds that that relates to productivity relative to wages? The odds are infinitesimal. Mm -hmm. And I get, and the other criterion would be whether you could telecommute. Right. In other words, right. that, yeah, yeah. So clearly if you're, but if you're non-essential and you have the ability to work from home by, you know, conference call or whatever, then you could still, you know, that's, you're not part of that 20%. That's true. And that's why this isn't as bad as it would have been. I mean, the web has saved us. Oh yeah. The internet right. has saved us. Right. Yeah. This would have been catastrophic. So can you speak a bit, I have to say, I was amazed. And, and, and I guess this, we could transition then into, I know you organized some protests, but before we talk about, I'm, I'm curious to hear, you know, what you organized and, and, you know, what the yeah. results were. But just before we get into that with this, the analogy I was using is that, you know, you, you're, you're trying to make a connection with your, in the air, you know, you're in an airport somewhere, you know, before all this stuff happened and your, your flight's delayed and it, like, we're supposed to take off at 3 PM and they'll say estimate 4 PM. And then it gets to be 3.30 and they'll say estimated 5 p.m. And they'll just keep stringing you along. You yeah, know, like yeah. when you get the sense that they probably knew at the beginning it was going to be a three-hour delay. They needed a part and they just didn't want us to riot. And so right. that's the sense I got with this, that if people, if governors had said back in March, by the way, we're not going to be open until July, I think people would have said, that's crazy. We're not doing that. Whereas at first yeah. it was like, oh, just two weeks. So the hospitals yeah. don't get overwhelmed. And then, oh, okay. Yeah. And then they just kept dribbling it along. So can you, Yeah. do you agree with that? Or am I, or the public, I think, is the public I think that scared? that out well. Mm -hmm. And I just want to add one thing. I, I haven't watched sports news. I, I used to watch ESPN every mm -hmm. morning 
And of course, I know for some strange reason, there's nothing to report right. other than the latest about that guy in uh, in your state uh, who moved to Florida. What's his name? Uh, the quarterback. That's how little I've watched. I can't remember the guy's name. He's the best quarterback in history. What's his name? Now you're making me look bad. You New England Patriots. I'm not talking. To, I'm not going to name the quarterback of the Patriots. I'm not a Patriots guy. <laughs> anyway, Brady, Brady. Okay, folks, so I did know he was know talking latest, about Tom Brady. I just want to get that on the record, but I don't. I'm not. <laughs> so if you don't want to know about him, I'm a you're Buffalo not Bills fan. Yeah. Anymore. <laughs> and and um, and oh my goodness, what were we talking about that made me think? Oh oh, so on that show, for a while there, for the first few weeks, they're saying we're one day closer to the end mm. of this lockdown, and I think, and I've seen it elsewhere, and I think it has stopped. Like a week or 10 days ago, they stopped saying, you know what, that's not helpful. We're one day closer, but who knows, because it might just keep extending. Mm -hmm. The analogy I had when I was just in my head, I don't think I said it to anyone, is imagine you go to prison, but they don't tell you the prison sentence. Yeah. You're not going to be really happy that you served another day so you're closer because you're closer to what? Right. And that's the problem. Okay, so you you do agree though that they couldn't have said in the beginning how long it, it may have been, and also I'm yes I'm sc- like so I can't speak to other ones, but like here like my wife was following this stuff real close and we've been watching like the the press conferences that Charlie Baker, the governor of Massachusetts, would give, and she was just pointing out so like his body like he was real like fiddling with his ring and touching his nose like he was. You could tell early on when he was fielding questions, like he was being advised and he knew it was going to be worse than he was letting, you know what I mean? Like that kind of stuff. And, you know, what, what I can't read the guy's mind, but I I saw what what she was saying. And then they keep extending the stuff. So, I mean, do do you feel like, I I think in other words, the governors knew they were dribbling it out ahead of time. Like it wasn't that they just, Oh, well the facts, you know, we keep getting new information. Now we're going to extend it two weeks. Like I, I think, I think that's probably sl- only slightly too strong. They probably knew there was a high probability. Okay. Right. I mean, imagine that in California, we had gone a week with like 30 deaths, you know, mm-hmm. what do you really extended it? I don't know. Maybe he would have, I don't know, mm-hmm. but, uh, yeah, they, they, um, but I do think the rationale changed. The goalposts changed. Yeah, you want you to speak about that? Otherwise, it was flatten the curve. Well, man, that sucker is flat, and not only is it flat, it's flat and low. Mm-hmm. And so we've got tremendous capacity. But oh, you know what? Let's change the rationale, which is to me very upsetting. It's but again, it's typical government. Whether we're talking about government going to war, you know, oh, we got to get bin Laden. Oh, we got to reorganize the whole of Afghan society, you know, mm-hmm. all those kinds of things. Right. Or, did, oh, the reason we're going to Iraq is WMD. Oh, there aren't any. Yeah. Well, it was like still a good policy because Saddam was so bad and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Right. And it's right. right. So yeah. just to make, I mean, I'm sure 95% of the listeners know what we're talking about, just to, to spell it out, perhaps for posterity. So originally, and I even on my Twitter, I asked on Twitter, so this is scientific. Um, you know, this is, this is up there with, you know, Winston Churchill's histories. Um, I, I said, hang on. The, originally the rationale for why we were locking down was we have to flatten the curve, meaning we can't overwhelm the hospital system. So it's not that we're going to reduce the overall number of Americans who get infected with this thing. It's just that we can't have them all get infected in the next month because right. the people who need hospitalization will then overwhelm this and more people would die than need be the case if we could push it into the future that was the rationale. And, and, you know, maybe that's true. So to me, that wouldn't justify coercion, but that conceivably right. in a free society would justify like, you know, voluntary, you know, people who could would stay home and that kind of stuff. Okay. So then clearly, and, and Ben Powell made this point well, he's saying, okay, so the thing to check then is hospital utilization and except maybe in New York city around, you know, the country, maybe New Jersey and maybe Massachusetts or something, but clearly it's hospitals are are down. Like people aren't going into the ER. They're afraid of catching the thing. And you know, hospitals are furloughing nurses and doctors and whatever. So clearly, like you say, the, the curve is, if anything, you know, hospitals are in financial trouble right now because their usage is so low. And so right. if that was the rationale, then clearly we could start opening up. And yet yeah, that's, you know. Sorry, someone's trying to reach me and it seems like they're trying to reach me badly. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, Okay, we're good. Okay, yeah. Um, 
So, uh, yeah. It, it, um, but, but let, if I could just push it. So the thing, though, that's con- – it doesn't at all surprise me that governors who, you know, listen to experts and whatever and did the lockdown, maybe, maybe behind the scenes, they're upset. And I, and I did see, um, Cuomo, the, you know, New York state governor, he actually had a a few things where it sounded like he was mad that, yeah, I kind of got hoodwinked by these people. I heard about that. Yeah. And I don't know if he, if he's like since walked that back or not, but so whether they say, Paul, you could see how they can't admit, Oh yeah, we did this and we shouldn't have. And so they would, but what surprises me is the rank, like general people, like, you know, and all I can do is is based on Twitter and stuff, but it seems like they just seamlessly went from flatten the curve to, and also like, I've noticed people like they went from, Oh, we all got to wash our hands. to we got to wash, wear masks. Now it was like, whatever the government's latest thing was, you know, they were just you know on board with it. And it seemed like there was very little introspection as to wait a minute. Why does this story keep changing? Yeah, I think that's right. And I think, yeah, government gets away with a lot. <laughs> I mean, psychologically, do you, I wonder if it's partly because, you know, there's different teams. And so if you're, if you, if you're a kind of person who hates like the libertarian crybabies who complain about this stuff that you don't want them yeah. to be right. And so even though you might notice that, oh yeah, my side's rationale did kind of evolve. It's like, well, Still, it, it makes sense. Like, yeah, we, yeah, we, should, right, we do need right. testing and tracing in place before we open up. Otherwise, that'd be crazy. We'd have a, re- a spike. And so, yeah, yeah. No, I, it, it is crazy how rationales change and people go along with them. I mean, well, the good news is I think people are getting very upset, mm-hmm. even in California. So on that point, then, I know you recently were a co-organizer of a, of a protest. And so I didn't yeah. know you were such a hippie. What, tell us what's going on here. Well, actually, I got I, I attended my first protest in around the mid around 2007 when uh, just after the Libertarian Party, or, sorry, the Libertarian Party, the uh, uh, Libertarians for Peace, not a Libertarian, but Libertarians for Peace joined the Peace Coalition of Monterey County. And I started going to the protests and sometimes I was asked to be one of the speakers. So this is my first protest back in late last dec, late in the first decade of the 20th century. And then I organized one after Obama became president on uh, how, why we should get out of Afghanistan. So I had a little bit of experience with it. And so I thought there was this big protest in Sacramento. That's a six hour round trip drive for me. No way I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. And I just thought if I can get 10 people in Monterey, we have a population in the peninsula of about 100,000. If I can get 10 people, that's pretty good because I can tell the sentiment around here is still pro-lockdown. Mm-hmm. And so the Monterey Herald, which usually treats libertarians badly, mm-hmm. laid it totally straight in their news story about it on Thursday. We put out a press release. And by the way, we didn't overclaim. I made sure I didn't put anything in about what the fatality rate is. Mm-hmm anything like that. We claimed things we knew were true. Mm-hmm. And and we put it out and they had the most objective news story. I'm, I'm still in shock that they treated us that well. Hmm. And then a young woman it appeared Thursday and then a young woman interviewed me Thursday and it showed up Friday morning on the local CBS affiliate and she did a fantastic job. And so the word kind of got out. I didn't even try to publicize it on Facebook because I heard Facebook was shutting those things down. I didn't right. want to be shut down for any reason. And so I show up around a quarter to one. It was supposed to start at one. I have all these signs we've made. I found a, a friend who's a bit of an artist. He made all these signs. And um, my, I told Can I ask that, you, like, what, was the, what were the signs saying? Like, what was the messaging? Um, my wife had a big input into this. Don't do things that are too abstract. So there were two main ones. All jobs are essential. Okay which by the way, isn't quite accurate. I don't think the governor's job is. <laughs> um, and, and, um, and the lockdown now. Mm-hmm. So very clear. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, my artist friend took what he called artistic license and put some of his own ones in there, but they were all good and mm-hmm. they weren't nasty right. and they were just on target with the message. Sometimes a little about freedom, which is kind of a good idea to some extent to talk about that. And um, so I show up with these signs, these roughly, 12 signs I have. And my friend Lawrence shows up with another 10 or so signs. And as I said to my wife, if we get 10 people, that's a success. Can, can I stop you? Though? So what do you, what do you mean? Like, where was it? And did you have, 
Oh, Did you have to get a, a permit standard, or something, or you just show up in a, a park? standard place in Monterey mm-hmm. where you have these things. Okay. It's called Window on the Bay. Mm-hmm. It's right on the ocean. It's across from a McDonald's, and everyone knows that's where things happen. Okay. And the nice thing is, if people want to, and I wish they'd done it a little more, but if they want to, even with a large crowd, you can have social distancing, mm-hmm. right? You can have 150 people and just have them in rows because it's along a large stretch of the of the major thoroughfare, right. and you could have everyone six feet from everywhere else. It didn't work out that way, right. but we did say we'd bring masks. We brought masks, you know, for people who wanted them. Mm-hmm. I wish more people had used them, but anyway, I'd say fifty to seventy percent of people used them. Now, and if, so if you don't, I, mind, I started to keep it up, but I'm just curious just to get your because a lot of the stuff is real nuanced. Is that because you knew? if everyone was there without a mask, it would look like you guys didn't believe there was a threat or just you didn't want people getting sick going to your event? Both. Okay. I think the first one was the more important, mm-hmm. but the second one, as I've said, and I said it to the reporter who did a good job of reporting on it, mm-hmm. by the way, I take this seriously. Mm-hmm. I think this is substantially worse than the flu. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, let's, let's show we take it seriously because, because I do. Right. And when people would come up to me, I say, Please keep your distance, right, right. including one guy who used the F word on me, <laughs> especially told him to keep his distance. And uh, anyway, so I show up at a quarter to one, figuring well, I'll be one of the first. And there are 35 people there mm-hmm. with their own signs. And my friend Lawrence, who are coordinator, he's there with signs. And by the time we hit one o'clock, I've done two interviews. One o'clock is when it starts. And there are over 100 people there. And so I would calculate that at its peak, there were about 130 people. And the other thing we said is we didn't want people to be able to dismiss this because it was pro-Trump. A, it's not pro-Trump. I'm not pro-Trump. Right. And neither is Lawrence. And B, it's not about Trump. It's literally not about Trump. It's about the lockdown, which is a state issue. Mm -hmm. And so we asked people and one person said, well, it's a free country. And And Lawrence said to him, yeah, it is. You want to bring your Trump sign, you're free to do so. We just please don't. Right, right. <laughs> and there were zero Trump signs, mm. which is unheard of. There was one mega hat, and it was worn by a friend of mine who's very pro Trump. Right, right. Um, and that was it. And so it was fantastic in that sense. Good natured crowd, kind of joking around. Uh, only one sign out of, because people brought their own signs, only one sign that I wish the person hadn't used. It's a pretty nasty hit on Newsom, which I think, you know, is deserved in a sense, but still, I don't want that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's an incredibly successful protest. And I was just, after a while, I put, I handed my sign to someone who wanted a sign and I just started walking around, you know, just enjoying, enjoying Mm -hmm. the crowd during the moment. It was really fantastic. Now you said you didn't use Facebook, but how did people know about this? How did you get the word out? Uh, I think from the Herald article, from um, the CBS affiliate thing in the morning, from just word getting out, word of mouth. And, um, and, and yeah, so it was, uh, oh, and here's the other thing. When I organized my Afghan war protest, I went to the Monterey police to get a permit, mm-hmm. which I don't think you should have to do, but why not play by the rules when they automatically hand out permits? Right. I even remember the name of the policewoman who always signed it, Leslie Sané. And she was always nice. I didn't go this time mm-hmm. because I thought, what if under these rules they say you can't have these protests? Right. Then we're violating something I was told not to do. Mm-hmm. And so my biggest fear was the police would shut us down. When we were there for an hour, the police must have gone by five, six, seven times, always just going by. Mm -hmm. One policeman parked across the street, uh, this busy street in a parking lot for the whole time. My guess is he was just there to make sure someone didn't beat someone up. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, so we had no trouble with that, which I was just delighted by. And I promised my wife, I said, I've always been able to answer honestly the question, have you ever been arrested with the answer? No. <laughs> and if that police, if a policeman came up, tried to disperse us, I'd try to talk him out of it. I always mm-hmm. have a good sense of when policemen get pushy. Once he gets to the pushy point, I'm out of there, mm-hmm. you know? And, and, uh, my, my friend Lawrence said, here's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I was going to um, say you'd have a so, lot more street cred if you could say you got arrested to protest in the lockdown. It'd be yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so can I ask the, the person that came up and was using foul language? It was someone who was for the lockdown and didn't like what you guys were doing. Yeah. Really hard to tell. I was being interviewed by one of the local TV stations uh-huh. and I made the following statement and he was, I could tell he was listening. Right. I said, this is unprecedented. Many people grant, and I don't think this made it onto the news, but I'm not sure. Many people grant that when you have a pandemic, it's reasonable for government to quarantine those who are sick. Mm-hmm. This is a first in history when they're quarantining those of whom they know a huge, huge percent are well. Mm -hmm. And that interview ends. He comes up to me and says, how do you explain the 1919 pandemic? And I go, or the flu, I go, what? He goes, they quarantined people who were well. And I thought, you know what? I I spoke beyond what I knew. Like, maybe he's right. Mm -hmm. So, so then. So um, when he said, when you said he said the F word, it was flu. Well, no. <laughs> so then I said, uh, he's, and then he said, you're an economics professor. You ought to know that. And he comes right up to me, like right. mm-hmm. a foot and a half from me mm-hmm. in a very threatening way. And so I don't want to use the F word. So I'll use right. the F word that way. Right. Uh, and so, so then he comes up to me and I said, please, please keep your distance. Mm-hmm. And for two reasons, he was threatening, but also the whole point about distancing. Right. And he goes, F you. Uh-huh. So I pull away from him. He comes up a few minutes later and I've had now time to think. Mm-hmm. He comes up and wants to talk again. I said, you know what? You might be right about that. I take it back. I don't know that about 1919. Mm-hmm. And, and, my, and my objection was to you invading my space and using the F word mm-hmm. and he goes, I didn't use the F word. And I said, yeah, you did. And he goes, F you. <laughs> huh. That's sort of a performative <laughs> contradiction there. That's good. Yeah, yeah. I don't know off the top. I know Alex Tabarrok at a uh, margin revolution was like linking. This is like a couple of weeks ago to papers talking about the experience of, so I know they did things like cancels big events and whatever, but I don't know if they, you know, imposed lockdowns per se back then. Well, I woke up early this morning mm-hmm. and did a search and I haven't found any evidence that he's right. And, and like, I read the book by uh, John, what's his name? Uh, I, I studied pandemics during my um, sabbatical, 2007, 2006, 2007. And I read that book everyone's talking about, about the Spanish flu. And I brought it home yesterday mm-hmm. from my downtown office where I had it. And I looked on in the index. There's nothing about quarantine. I went online today. The only quarantines I could find were of sick people. Mm-hmm. So I think I was right. And also, I mean, I, I've heard like it's, it's sick people or like someone who was directly in contact with a sick person and you keep them just for right. your own observation to make right. sure, did you catch it kind of thing? Right. Right. That kind of um, thing. Okay. Well, I know you got to get going here in a few minutes, but can you, so that's interesting. I didn't realize you had looked at that stuff. So do you, just in closing, do you want to offer some remarks just as an economist who's concerned about liberty? But let me put it to you this way. I think a lot of libertarians right now, their main way of dealing with this is to say, this is completely overblown. The media is hyping this, you know, look at the outside New York City, you know, it's not a big deal, but suppose it were. You know, it, it sounds like you agree, and, and also people know, who listen to me know that you know I'm I'm taking this thing seriously. But suppose something that comes through that's ten times as deadly as this thing, you know, it, it, would you say, oh yeah, in that case, the lockdowns would be okay, or you know, what can you just speak to that? I think I'd have to say there's some number mm-hmm. at which they'd be okay. And what I did you see my debate with Justin? Wolfers I didn't get to yet? watch it yet. Sorry. Okay. It was a tremendous debate in the sense that we were both very, very, you know, good and friendly towards each other mm-hmm. and not trying to pull quick ones. But I knew in advance there would be a chance for each, us each to ask questions. And I thought he didn't ask this, but I thought, what if he asked me, David, if you thought voluntary social distancing wouldn't work and a lockdown would, how many deaths would have to be avoided for you to favor a lockdown? Mm-hmm. 
And the answer I came up with was two million. <laughs> so, so in other words, it's uh, a high number, right? But it was a people thought it was a plausible number two months ago, right? And, but here's the thing: I think social distancing works, and that's been the point I've been making over and mm. over. I think that was the, one of the strongest parts of my debate with Justin mm. was people attribute all this slowing down to the lockdowns. But we had a lot of social distancing voluntarily before the lockdowns. I pointed to my wife's and my behavior, but not just our behavior. What I saw in the street, walking down the street, people come up and, and they go to their right. You go to, sorry, they go to their left. You go to, well, anyway. I know what you, you mean. You make sure yeah. six feet apart. And, and there's all that stuff happening. My wife and I quit going to restaurants about a week before the lockdown. Just mm. all of these things people were doing. Right. And so that's, I think when people see, and I think there might be a role for someone not named Cuomo or Trump or whatever, who really just wants to communicate what is known and what is not known. So if you had an amazing president, say someone like me, <laughs> who, you know, would just say, okay, here's what I know. Here's what I don't know. Please err on the side of caution. Do this, do that. And let's get through this for a month and see where we are. Mm -hmm. We're not going to impose anything. I actually think that would work. Mm -hmm. And I still don't even think, even with a 2 million figure, you would need a lockdown. And that's why I said his question would have had to have been if social distancing wouldn't work at all. Right. But I think social distancing yeah. works. And that kind of loads it in because I remember somebody like when I used – to work with Arthur Laffer. And the question was like, he said something like, Oh, if, if, if socialism was a more productive system, then I would be for socialism. And I thought I wouldn't be, but like, yeah. that was such a weird hypothetical. You know what I mean? It's sort of like yeah, if two plus two equals five, you know what I mean? Like it, it was kind of hard for me to even grapple with that. So, yeah. so that yeah. it is kind of loading it in there to say if, if voluntary stuff didn't work. Cause yeah, like you say, I, I think, yeah, like restaurants and movie theater owners and airlines would have had to convince you know, their, their customers No, it's safe to, to keep using our service and they would have come up with ways. Right. And one of the things I used in my debate and I used it in one of my posts on econ log was about Starbucks. I used to go and get coffee for my wife at Starbucks a few times a week. Mm. And I got this email from them about 10 days before the lockdown saying, here's what we're doing. We're limiting the number of people who are coming in. We're making sure people are distant. We're cleaning our counters like crazy. They're doing all this stuff to try to make it work. And that's what I love about capitalism. Firms saying, we want to survive. How do we survive? We've got to convince people that they're relatively safe using our good or service. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, they're always thinking that way. And, you know, as we're running we're down here, but you just said something too a minute, a minute ago that really resonated with me that right now, the so-called public health authorities, many of them are tied to government directly or indirectly, or, you know, these international yeah. organizations. So people don't trust them and rightly so. And you think that they do have, like, for example, the mask wearing thing. I know a lot of those people couldn't tell the public, yeah, go get masks. Cause they knew, Oh no, that's not, that's not what the, what the line is right now. We've decided to not tell them yeah. that because we got to reserve it for the health, whatever the rationale was. And then all of a sudden they flip. And so, yeah. I, I think, yeah, in a, in a freer society where they, or even just one where, you know, it was a night watchman state or something and there wasn't, you know, a surgeon general, there wasn't the, the who, there wasn't all these things that, yeah, like just people who were voluntary, you know, authorities on medicine could have been advising America, you know, and people would have just known, you know, oh, I trust that person because they've built yeah. up credibility over the years, you know, giving good advice about whatever. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's right. That's right. Yeah. By the way, um, I could go at least another five minutes if you okay, want. Okay, yeah. But yeah, so why don't we then, you know, sort of pivoting back to your expertise as an economist here, what do you – how do you see this this playing out? So I know you think the the full recover, or, you know, decent recovery wouldn't happen until at least August. But do you think at that point it would be some semblance? And I know you and I have a difference of opinion that I – thought the Fed blew up a giant acid bubble and that the economy was going to be in bad shape this summer anyway. And yeah. so for me, this is just like, I don't even know what to do with this. This is just like kicking it when it was yeah. done. But I think you didn't necessarily agree. So 
what do you think, you know, going into the fall, do you think it's just, oh yeah, it'll be, it'll be, we'll be climbing out of this or how do you see that playing out? I think we'll be climbing out of it. I think it'll depend on, well, it's hard to know. Um, so I think a lot of the requirements for ending the lockdown are going to be about face masks and gloves and so on. And then the question is, how hard is that enforced? Mm -hmm. How sensibly is that enforced? And that's a big unknown. So let's say they find a gym where people aren't doing that. My, my daughter teaches Pilates. She was telling me on Zoom the other day, it's going to be hard for her to work with clients who have to breathe hard and have to breathe through a mask, right. especially old clients. And so I don't know how that's going to work. And so I can imagine they get pretty mess, pr pretty intrusive and slow down the recovery. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's just really hard to know. Another it's anecdote what, just along those lines, I know in that, I know people in Nashville and apparently with the rollout, the phase out, it's like restaurants and whatever can open with social distancing and mass, but they can't have live music. And it's, you know, just weird arbitrary things like, well, why would having musicians on this? And I think probably it's because they don't want there to be a big crowd. And so they know oh. if we allow music, you know, they're going to have a bigger crowd than they're supposed to and blah, 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 you know, that kind yeah. of stuff. I think the only good thing that's helping us is the timing in the seasons. So now almost everywhere in America, you can have outdoor tables. Mm -hmm. And if the government will, if the local governments here will just relax and say, you know what? We know there's a sidewalk there. We're going to let you have the tables on the sidewalk, even though you don't have a permit. If they allowed a lot of that, that could really help the restaurants, mm -hmm. for example. Okay. And so I, to me, I guess the one last thing of optimism would be, you know, the federalism and that some states are clearly more aggressive and they're going to open. And so it kind of might be like with like marijuana legalization that once a few states do it and they didn't have, you know, catastrophe, it's kind of right. hard then for the drug warriors to say, no, no, if, you, if we open it up, we're going to have addicts in the street. So with this, right. again, hope, hopefully there's not like a huge spike in, in cases, but if some yeah, states open, our eyes yeah. Georgia and Colorado, right? Right. So if some states, you know, open and then there's not a catastrophe, presumably it would be hard for the other governors to just keep digging in their heel. But, but again, I'm surprised they did it this, this aggressively already. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, I'm not a good predictor. I thought Hillary Clinton would beat Donald Trump. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, folks, my guest has been David Henderson. David, thanks so much for your time. Thanks, Bob.